Now, I don't believe in the vehicle that day that the Lord said to me, Paul, I like you just because I preach or just because I love Jesus. But I do believe that the like is not just a personal revelation. I had someone ask our ministry that and say, was that God likes you thing a personal revelation? Or can you prove that in the scripture? I believe you can see that in the scripture, that God does indeed like you, that God is affectionate towards you, that God would like to hang out with you. God appreciates and values who you are. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. This is a message that will hit our website in a few weeks. I just did in California where we take that Old Testament scripture, you are fearfully and wonderfully made, and we dig it out in the Hebrew. And what fearfully and wonderfully made means is you are awesome and amazing. Those are the two closest English words to fearfully and wonderfully. You are awesome and amazingly made. It doesn't mean you're awesome and amazing. It means you were made in an awesome and amazing manner. And if you'll know that, you'll live up to that. Because a lot of people don't realize that they were made in an awesome and amazing manner. They're living below their standard. And so if God likes, God loves you and then God likes you, then what does that bring out of you? What does that do to you? Well, the first pushback is always, oh yeah, God loves us, but God doesn't really like all the stuff we've been doing. And I might shock you right here. I agree. I don't think he does like all the stuff we've been doing. And I'm going to tell you why. Because the Bible's about family. And I don't like all the stuff my son does. And I don't like all the stuff my daughter does. And I think if you say you do, I think you're lying. I think you're trying to be super spiritual and really holy for all the people sitting near you and acting like you like all the stuff your kids do. Don't lie. You don't like all the stuff your kids do. That's what it means to be a parent. You're not going to like all the stuff your kids do. Do you not love them? Oh, yeah, you love them. Do you like them? Sure. Sure. I don't like all the stuff they do. That's a whole different question. Man, I don't like some of the stunts he pulls. I don't like some of the decisions she makes. But I like her a lot. I like her enough I'd introduce you guys if she was here. If my son were here, I would introduce you. I'm not going to introduce you to people I don't like. Hey, Mark, here's a dude I can't stand. I'd like to introduce you to him. (laughs) So that maybe your life could be a living hell as well. (laughs) Give me a call. Tell me how it goes over coffee. No, you don't, I wouldn't do that. You only introduce people that you like. I want my friends to like my friends. You get excited introducing my friends to my friends, but it's that, that passion and that love for them that is, I say, is agape. I don't, I don't know for sure what agape looks like, but I know God loves me passionately, and so that for me is agape, and I feel that way about my kids, and I know God likes me because the scripture says he does, and I know what it means to like my kids, but I also know what it means, I don't know what it means to not love them, and I don't know what it means to not like them, but I do know what it means to not like some of the stuff they're doing, and that lets me know that maybe, just maybe, my father doesn't like some of the junk I'm doing either. And I think we've got to stop being scared in the grace community. We've got to stop being scared to say that for fear that people are going to think we're back into works. There was nothing that was just proclaimed to you that should make you think your righteousness is based on your performance. Your righteousness is never based on your performance. No more than my son's actions make him my son. He is my son. If he acts a fool, he is my son acting a fool. But he's mine, and he'll never not be mine. And I love him as if he were not acting a fool. But I don't always like the foolish things he's doing. And I wish he wouldn't do them. Right? How do we cultivate like? We spend time together. We play together. We grow together. We know one another's favorite foods and what songs they like. We hang out with them enough that we figure that stuff out. You notice how when you meet somebody for the first time, you haven't been around them very much, or maybe it's not even the first time, but you don't spend a lot of time around them. Silence is awkward and painful. You work very, very hard to keep silence from happening. And so you hang out with someone with whom you're not very close, and you make sure to always have a go-to something. Ask a question. Wait for a response. That's why we talk about weather. We don't need to talk about the weather. They got an app on their phone. They just walked from their car to the building, and yet it's a good 30-second filler at any time. Has it rained lately? No. You think it's going to? Boy, we need it. Sure would be nice, wouldn't it? How much rain did you get last week at your place? All right. No, we're not even going to remember. It's unimportant chit-chat. You don't do that with your brother. You don't do that with your wife. You don't walk into your wife. 
You got home from work, you go, boy, we, do, we need some rain, don't we? Yes, honey, we need some rain. I was telling the girls at the salon how much rain we needed. You know, remember when we were younger and it rained that whole week? Yeah, you know what? My dad told me about this time. We don't do that stuff. <laughs> now, why not? I like you. I'm not scared of silence. With people I like, silence is beautiful. I was driving down the road with a pastor recently, and I had been to his church two or three times. We've conversed, talked on the phone, text back and forth, gotten pretty close. And I was in the passenger seat, and he was driving, and we went down the road for a stretch. I wasn't thinking anything about it. My mind, I don't even know where my mind was. I was looking around, and he said, hey, I think what just happened between us is such a good sign that you and I have become good friends. And I had to ask, what just happened? <laughs> and we hadn't talked for like five minutes. And he said, I just realized we haven't talked in five minutes, and it didn't feel weird. Well, it felt so opposite of weird to me that I didn't even know what he was talking about. And I said, you know what, you're right. I think our relationship just went to another level. <laughs> now, if you just keep going with that, it gets bizarre. All right, it just starts getting weird. We don't have to keep talking about our relationship. You know, we're just friends. But what happens is as we, we grow, we, we play. And I, when I say play, I don't mean, you know, jumping jacks and running around pushing trucks in the dirt. But play is the interaction of community. Okay? That's why in theater, you are players. You play a role, but you interact not just with one another on stage, but you interact with the audience, with the writer of the script, with everything that came before it, and you try to influence the, the feelings. What are you doing, really? You're communicating. You're growing together. And so that's what play is all about. We need more of that in our relationships. We need more of that in our churches. We need more of that in our marriages. I see a lot of marriages in trouble, even in grace, and it's because we have spouses that don't play with one another. And what I mean by that, they don't play anywhere, much less in the bedroom, and they need to, because if they did, they could channel their lust in the right direction. I, think, I don't think we're talking enough about things like pornography. I don't think we're talking enough, and I think we think it's legalism. So I think we're leaving alone. I also think we're embarrassed. I don't think we're talking enough about our relationships. I think it's because we've substituted love outward towards the world. In some, in some cases, we've even thought that that was enough. We didn't have to like each other. We just had to love sinners. And some of us are even in relationships in which it's all about loving the people on the outside while not even liking the people you go home to. I've watched that destroy ministries. People that have a great capacity to love the sheep in their church and can't like their spouse. That's a problem. That's where something's been sacrificed at the altar of love, and the thing that's been sacrificed is like. So yeah, we should be playing with one another. And should, should that draw us in, in our relationships and in our sex life? Of course it should. How can it not? We've got to stop treating lust like it's a bad thing. We've got to start channeling it towards the person that we're supposed to be lusting after. And that's been our issue. Is we, why am I on this? I mean, really, sometimes you're just there, and you got to talk about it. It's for someone, I think. Hey, let me tell you, those moments right there, this stuff right here is the stuff you get walked up to afterwards, and people say, that's what I needed. The whole stuff was good, but that was the 30 seconds I needed. That's life-changing. It... We cultivate relationships in play. Okay, you do that on the playground, you do that in community, you can, do that... You can even do that in the bedroom. I don't want to get, you don't need me to get more than that, but I will say this. Let me go back to lust for a second. Listen, if you, look, I mean, I'm very serious about this. If you, if you treat your spouse as if they are so holy, they cannot be lusted after, your lust will come out. All right? And it's ungodly to treat your spouse that way. Well, there's a holy, I don't think of it that way. Then you don't understand the purpose of play. You don't understand the purpose you were brought together. It was not just to love one another, it was to like one another was an intimacy that gets translated kiss in the New Testament from time to time. Agape doesn't get translated kiss. Phileo does. Because you don't go around kissing the enemy that you love. You kiss with intimacy. That's why Judas regretted what happened to Jesus. Because the kiss was real. It was a true affection. Misguided 
sell of Jesus, yes. But the affection was real. He really did like him. And the fact that they were going to kill him is why he brought the silver back into the temple to go, that wasn't the deal. You weren't supposed to kill him. You were supposed to talk to him. Why? Because I think if you talk to the guy I like, you'd like him. See that? And so there's that closeness, there's that intimacy, there's that pull. 